good afternoon and welcome to Global Report. We have back with us today Mr. Mark Cohen, who is the CEO of the Legal Mosaic, the Executive Chairman of Digital Legal Exchange and the Catalyst in Residence at the Singapore Academy of Law. Welcome to the show, Mark. It's great to be back with you, Lily. Thank you. Yes, I should say welcome back to the show. Um, again, it's 6 a.m. here, so I wish to sit on the onset that if I were to yawn any time during the show, it is me, not you. I will tell you from our first show, which was also aired at 6 a.m. your time, uh, people who saw it marveled when I told them that it was so early for you. Well, thank you. Well, you are very inspiring, and I know that every minute spent here is going to be worth my waking up early. Now, Mark, um, at our last conversation, I recall broaching up upon um, how policymakers have attempted thus far to resolve the access to justice issue. And you gave the number of 85% for United States and 35% for Singapore, meaning that 85% of those in need of legal services in US have no access to justice or easy access to justice. And likewise for 35% in Singapore. So tell us today, how can legal tech bridge this gap between the law and the legal clients? Great question. Well, one way I think of course is regulatory um, reform. Um, and I'm not talking about deregulation by any means, but what I am talking about is regulation that is really tailored to address that, uh, those statistics, which I think we can all agree are not only lamentable from uh, an individual perspective for people who really need legal services, but also lamentable from a societal perspective because it is very difficult to maintain a, a, a confidence, public confidence in the law if um, most people uh, rightly or wrongly believe that access to law and lawyers is, is only available to the wealthiest among us or large companies. Um, so how, how might regulators um, reimagine this? Well, one way they could do it is to draw a distinction between what activities require licensed attorneys and what activities are really part of ultimately delivering the business of legal services. For example, um, you know, certain uh, technological applications, um, certain services that could be done by other professionals, not necessarily licensed attorneys. Um, and certain services that could be uh, automated. Um, these are all examples of ways that I think regulators should look at the panoply of uh, tools and resources presently available, um, and then look to the ultimate objective of regulation, trying to balance um, you know, the, the interests of the public with having access to legal tools and resources versus um, you know, having interlopers pretending to be lawyers, not having the requisite skills and training. Um, but clearly, I think that the, there is too much of a protectionist bent um, in favor of, that ends up discouraging competition to lawyers um, from so-called non-lawyers. Um, there's too much emphasis on that, and I think not enough emphasis on how can we more creatively tailor regulation that's going to ensure that the vast percentage of our population have access to legal services when they need them. Now, Mark, from what you have seen so far, going by what you just said, you know, how well have alternative um, legal service providers been received? Well, um, take one very large one uh, that operates in the uh, retailer people segment of the market in the United States, a company called LegalZoom. Um, LegalZoom now has close to um, 10 million customers. Um, to, and um, these are everything from individuals um, to small and uh, mid-sized enterprises um, in a wide array of different kinds of legal services that do not necessarily involve um, engaging in a formal attorney-client relationship and all the unique characteristics of that. Um, and LegalZoom 
um, has, uh, is a very data-driven business. It's very technologically enabled. Um, it's very scaled, it's very efficient, um, and it's very cost-effective. And as a consequence of those characteristics, Lily, um, I don't think it's a surprise that LegalZoom's net promoter score is significantly higher than the whitest of the white shoe traditional large law firms. So um, I think that one could sa safely say that with respect at least to that example, and there are certainly others, um, the um, client's or customer satisfaction is actually higher than that of um, most traditional legal service providers. And what about uh, on the government side? Have they been welcoming such services? Because you mentioned protectionism. Have they been welcoming such services? Well, I think it really depends on the particular um, uh, jurisdiction that you're talking about. Um, in the United States, it's really you know, kind of strange in that on the one hand, um, there are these uh, still very protectionist regulations in place. Um, uh, and at the same time, um, there is a proliferation of so-called alternative legal service providers. I would prefer to call them law companies. Um, that is, you know, companies that it, it provide legal services that may or may not uh, include engaging in the practice of law. Um, so in the United States, in the corporate segment, uh, there's a bit of a, schiz a schizophrenia. Um, that is, in the corporate segment, um, no one is ever going to say to a Microsoft or Google, oh, you know, your alternative legal service provider may in a hyper-technical sense be engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. Well, they're not. One reason they're not is because very often these uh, providers, if they're not engaged in practice, are working under the supervision of either a law firm, a private law firm, or the company itself. Now, flip that around. In the um, individual or small business side of the marketplace, the so-called retail side, LegalZoom had to fight off not one, not two, but I believe an even dozen uh, of state lawsuits claiming that it was engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. It won every single one of them but at significant cost, and had it not been well capitalized, it would have been driven out of business. Um, that's just not right. Now, you mentioned uh, legal reforms. I know in Singapore, the government has been putting big money into the hands of law firms to encourage them to embark on legal, you know, technological adoption. Uh, my question now is, let's say hypothetically, we have a lawyer who used to charge one client $600 for one hour of work. And with legal tech adoption, he can now do the same work in 10 minutes. In other words, he can now take on six clients instead of one client for that one hour. So my question to you is, can we not expect a lawyer to charge the six clients $100 each so that he still makes his $600 an hour? Or are we gonna end up with a lawyer that's still gonna charge $600 per client so that he now makes $3,600 an hour? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I would hope and expect that in a relatively short period of time, um, the marketplace will give the resounding answer that it's going to be $100 over six uh, uh, different clients. Um, there's another element to your hypothetical, Lily, which is this. Um, there, one has to question whether a $600 an hour lawyer should be doing that particular task in the first instance, or whether that particular task, instead of being done in the first instance by a $600 more senior lawyer, could be done by a, a younger lawyer. There has to be a questioning of, is the appropriate resource, whether it's machine or human, is the appropriate resource being deployed for the right task. Um, that is, I think, something that um, the legal industry is um, increasingly um, being directed 
to reconsider, not necessarily by its own initiative or volition, but rather um, by um, uh, clients and customers. You know, so that is I think the a perfect. lot of the change, pardon me, but a lot of the change, just to wrap it up, a lot of the change is being driven from the consumer perspective, not from the provider perspective. Whereas in so many businesses, you know, they are looking for ways to make the customer experience that much more pleasing. You know, that is the perfect question to my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, but um, I do have a concern. You know, the problem arises, I think, when the funding, let's say if the, the lawyer is funding his own investment of this technology and he wants to make more per hour, I can totally understand that. But what if the funding came from the government? Because in Singapore, a law practice can secure up to 80% of public funding for tech adoption. What if that funding comes from the government? How can we better ensure that you know, the masses benefit from this and not just the law practice? Uh, well, one way to do it would be to, you know, have um, platforms that are not necessarily um, uh, uh, for a particular law firm, but you have much more of a, uh, of a kind of an Amazon marketplace um, that, you know, everyone could uh, tune into. Um, and you could have it broken down so that, you know, confidentiality, proprietary information and data could be walled off within the larger marketplace. But I think that there is a tremendous amount of duplication of effort that goes on among law firms. Um, why should every single law firm have to you know, come up with technological solutions when they all are using the technology or should be using it for fundamentally identical purposes. Um, and so I would be much more in favor were I, you know, a, a, a counseling with um, whether it's a government or whether it's private equity, uh, any source of capital, I would say, are there ways that you would be able to consolidate this so that you don't have the same kind of repetition and, you know, sort of, creating alternate systems, why not one integrated system, um, which you know, could be available both to different providers as well as to consumers. That, I like you know. your proposal of capitalizing on economies of scale. I think that makes uh, perfect sense to me. You know, a thought just came to me because uh, back in the uh, mid 2000s, I, I was involved with getting doctors onto EMRs electronic medical records. And I recall, um, you know, some of them were humble, they were e eager to learn, but there, were, uh, there was a good number that found it beneath them to have to learn new technology, you know, especially from a female from Asia. So I'm just wondering, as you go about in your work, how have you gone about convincing these millionaire lawyers that what you are doing for them is of immense value to their law firm and their legal clients? How do you go about dismantling their pride and adjusting their mindset? Well, um, uh, one, one response is that uh, fortunately for me, I don't spend too much time trying to proselytize um, uh, law firm managing partners um, or others at law firms. But having said that, um, I have on occasion been invited to speak to groups of managing partners. In fact, every year when I go to Singapore, I do just that. Um, and um, one of the things that I tell them, which I think is a big advantage that I have, is that, hey, I was once sitting in your seat. Um, I was a managing partner of a law firm. And by the way, going all the way back to 1991, I tell a little uh, story from my own experience, which is I had, uh, when I uh, was formerly a, on the management team of the nation's second largest law firm. And then I decided to create my new model law firm that grew to be significantly um, a, a large boutique firm with highly sophisticated clients. And we had three offices around the United States. And I thought to myself, you know, it's very important that um, our offices be able to um, connect with each other in a very seamless way. This is in 1991. I want, instead of having three sets of libraries, I want to have one integrated library 
that is accessible to everyone from their, from their desk. Um, I want to have a centralized telephone system. And I want the client to think that I could be in any one of those places. Um, to me, it didn't matter, but to a lot of clients, particularly in those days, it was important that they felt that I can get a hold of him. Um, and, and so um, I spent a million dollars with one of my biggest clients, AT&T at the time. Um, and I said, these are the things that I want you to do. This is my use case. Um, can you do it? What's it gonna cost me? How long is it gonna take? Um, and 90 days later, we had all of that functionality. So I say to myself, if I did, and my clients loved it, absolutely loved it. It was the most customer friendly, customer centric thing I could possibly do. And my question is, if I was doing that back in 1991 with a T1 line that you wouldn't be, you know, necessarily remember as you probably weren't born, but it was, you know, it was just a, a very early uh, kind of um, a cable. Um, uh, and, which at the time was sort of bleeding edge. Um, and, you know, I say to myself, if I was doing that almost 30 years ago, don't you think that if all of your clients and customers are so focused on, you know, um, customer centricity for their own customers, don't you think that you should be, you know, starting to operate a little bit more as they do? Um, they have certain expectations, they have certain demands. Um, so I think really, Lily, there's a tremendous opportunity for law without reinventing the wheel to make far better use of existing technology. And by the way, we keep talking about legal technology as if, it, yes, there are specific use cases that are somewhat unique to law, but that's not to say that we can't borrow from other techno uh, technologies that already exist in business and have someone retrofit them to serve you know, our particular use cases instead of start, starting from scratch. So I think you know, we I, can I, be much more thoughtful and efficient about it. Yeah, I hate to say this, but um, T1 so, uh, rings a lot bell in my head. So I think- uh, I, think you <laughs> I, must think have, I think you must have <laughs> learned it from an uncle or a father or a mother. <laughs> Or, uh, yeah, uh, I hope so. I hope so. But you know, while the, the courts here and elsewhere are talking about uh, transformation design, I thought it will be apt for us to, to talk about transformation design. And just to be clear to our viewers, when we talk about transformation, we're not talking about mere automation, merely grafting um, technology onto very, very old ways of doing things. But what I noticed, what I want to say, Mark, is that you know, when people gather to talk about legal transformation of the courts, I notice that it's always the same people present. You have the lawyers, you have the judges, the policy makers, the law students, the legal technologies, alternative legal service providers. There is always, it seems, a, a very important voice missing. And that is the voice of the legal client, the voice of the litigant in person, the voice of the court user. So I raise this because Mark, I'm so concerned that if we were to continue with our design of a new system that only takes into account the professional voices, we are going to end up yet again with another lawyer-centric system. How can we better ensure that the voices of the true clients of the court are taken into account in this design? Well, for one thing, I would um, certainly suggest that you be one of the spokespeople for the legal industry um, because you frame it very convincingly. Um, you know, what other industry other than law would be so insular and have such hubris um, not to be able to include um, its customers in the dialogue of how to better uh, deliver its services. And make no mistake about it, the court is an integral part of delivering legal services. Now, there are some isolated instances of certain courts around the world actually being very proactive and providing tools, self-help tools um, to uh, people involved in, for example, contract disputes, where they could say, this is, you know, this is the law on certain key issues. Um, you know, here are some things that you might want to consider. Um, and nobody said that it requires a lawyer 
to resolve a dispute. Uh, lawyers may think that it's their birthright to um, resolve all disputes, um, but let's be honest about it. You know, legal disputes are, you know, um, disputes uh, in the mind's eye of lawyers, but not all disputes have to involve lawyers. And in fact, if you look at the uh, data, unfortunately, because lawyers are so bloody expensive um, and so inefficient and resistant to scale and all these other things, the vast majority of litigants today, uh, certainly in the United States and in many other countries around the world, the vast majority of, of litigants, um, particularly in you know, a, a smaller cases involving they may be important issues to the principals, but they involve a lesser amount of money. Um, you know, one or both sides uh, are, are, are proceeding on their own without the benefit of a lawyer. Um, it's particularly, uh, 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 I think, uh, uh, unfortunate to the point of being obnoxious where one side can afford a lawyer and the other can't and exploits that advantage. That is not the way the law should operate. So to your point, I could not agree with you more that it is absolutely essential. There should be virtually no conversation on you know, um, uh, modernizing um, uh, uh, courts and, and dispute resolution without first hearing um, the perspective of um, its prospective customers. I, I can't agree more because um, I mean, because ultimately we want the digital transformation to be successful, right? And in order for it to be successful, it has to take in account of the experience of the court user. I'll just raise a quick example. For example, here in Singapore, right after a hearing, I don't see any active solicitation of feedback. While the experience is still fresh in the mind of the litigants, I mean, there is a website somewhere, if you go dig for it in an, um, you know, via the internet, there is a feedback repository somewhere where you could submit your feedback. But I think it has to be more proactive. As you mentioned, some other courts are doing it. So I, I can't agree more. And now, by the way, that's a great word you use, proactive. That is one of the things that historically lawyers have not been. Um, they have not been proactive. We are living in a world where one must be proactive. Every other business is very proactive. And what is their central focus? on satisfying the customer, on anticipating what the customer wants now and anticipating what they might want next. That is what makes you know, companies like Amazon, um, the colossuses that they are, is that they are based on customer centricity in the truest sense of the word. And a note to lawyers in the audience, if you, you know, um, acquiesce to client demand, that you cut your legal fees or take a discount, that is not client centricity. Yeah, and if I may be so audacious as to add, you know, had it not been for this monopoly, um, I think um, a lot of the legal services would have been redundant by now. I, I, I quite agree with you. Now, um, Mark, I also want to talk about improving the court system. Um, have, have we thought, given thoughts to that? Because um, one of the questions I posed during your um, session with Richard Soskin at the Tech Law Fest was how we can also leverage technology, not just to enhance efficiency, but also to enhance transparency and fairness of the court system. Have you guys looked into that? Have you looked into that? Well, Richard is actually doing a little more work in that area than I, so maybe I can convince him to come on your program. Um, and you can take a deeper dive into that. But I would just uh, simply say that, um, you know, th there is a tremendous untapped opportunity that I think the legal system has um, to be able to do things like that. Likewise, why can't the judiciary take a much more active um, approach in terms of its use of data, publishing information that might give prospective litigants a clear roadmap of the likelihood of success under a certain set of circumstances. Um, roadmaps on any number of things. You know, I mean, think of the the the, the amount of data. Um, uh, you know uh, that 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 courts have. 
and all the, the data that could be um, meaningfully mined and used for good purpose. Um, but it seems that there's not much focus on that. Um, we really need a truly fresh approach to this, not just, you know, sort of thinking about tinkering al along the edges. You know, do we have, you know, uh, video hearings or not? I mean, that's, that's really, you know, just the very tip of the iceberg. We could be doing so much more, and we must. Thank you, Mark. I'll, I'll delve deeper into that with Richard then. Um, we have just three minutes left, so I want to touch on security issues. Um, I imagine with tech adoption, there's bound to be security issues, data breaches, email interception, hacking, things like that. How are we developing on that front? Because what I see now is emails floating between the cores and the code users, and most of them aren't even encrypted. And these emails contain very personal, very confidential information. So are we still playing catch up on the security end? I think we are. Um, but then again, you know, consider the, the alternative. Um, the alternative is in the old days, um, you have you know, very sensitive data um, in paper files. Um, someone could leave a paper file on the train as often happened. Um, someone you know, could um, walk into a, an office and, and literally cart out files, which happened not infrequently. Um, so there are always going to be you know, potential for mischief. But I think if you were you know, to those who say, oh, you know, using technology is going to be, you know, expose us to too great a risk, I would say the greater risk is not using technology effectively. Um, because there, you're, you're going to have a situation where, you know, you're so limited in what you can do. You know, there's already such an enormous backlog of cases, in part because we're so inefficient in, you know, the way the entire process. And finally, I would just say that I think we should start thinking the legal industry should be thinking of courts more as um, a process than a place. Why, why do you have to go to a particular building and, and wear a particular costume um, you know, to um, get involved in this process in today's world? Um, what you're really seeking is knowledge and, 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 and fairness and transparentness and, 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 and access. These are the things I think that we should be building the modernized court system around. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's been such a privilege talking to you. I can listen to you forever, but I think if we don't take the proactive approach to depart, the studio might just kick us off. Um, yeah. But yeah, before anyone forgets, uh, I just wish to state again that justice is a public good, just like water, just like electricity. It cannot be so costly. It cannot be so time consuming. And it doesn't have to be so unintelligible. So I appreciate you, Mark, for being a part of the solution towards uh, resolving the access to justice issue. Thank you so much for your time and the sharing of your expertise. My pleasure, Lily. Thank you.